Good morning and welcome to St. Luke's Episcopal Church and this morning's Palm Sunday Liturgy. Our liturgy this morning is a gateway, the very beginning of the sacred journey of Holy Week. And our service today is in many ways in two tones. We begin with the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem with cloaks lining the path of Jesus' entry into the town while folks in the crowd is shouting Hosanna in the highest. That same crowd will transform during our reading of the gospel into shouts of crucify him. On this day, the heart of our service is the gospel reading and we have over 15 members of our congregation of all ages who will be joining us in reading this sacred story. We begin our liturgy this morning with the Liturgy of the Palms. Blessed be the King that comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Let us pray. Assist us mercifully with your help, O Lord God of our salvation, that we may enter with joy upon the contemplation of those mighty acts whereby you have given us life and immortality. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been written. Untie it and bring it to me. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this, The Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went to Bethany with the twelve. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, almighty God, for the acts of love by which you have redeemed us through our, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. On this day, he entered to the holy city of Jerusalem in triumph and was proclaimed as King of Kings by those who spread their garments and branches of palm along his way. Let these branches be for us signs of his victory and grant that we who bear them in his name may ever hail him as our king and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life, who lives and reigns in glory with you and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let us go forth in peace. In the name of Christ, amen.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, in your tender love for the human race, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to take upon him our nature, to suffer death upon the cross, giving us the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may walk in the way of his suffering and also share his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 50, verses 4 through 9a. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher, that I may know how to sustain the weary with the word. Morning by morning he wakens wakens my ear, to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me. Who will declare me guilty? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have mercy on me, O Lord. For I am in trouble. My eye is consumed with sorrow, and also my throat and my belly. For my life is wasted with grief, and my years with sighing. My strength fails me because of affliction, and my bones are consumed. I have become a reproach to all my enemies and even to my neighbors, a dismay to those of my acquaintance. When they see me in the street, they avoid me. I am forgotten like a dead man out of mind. I am as useless as a broken pot. For I have heard the whispering in the crowd, fear is all around. They put their heads together against me, they plot to take my life. 
But as for me, I have trusted in you, O Lord. I have said, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Make your face to shine upon your servant, and in your loving kindness save me. The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ According to Mark It was two days before the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. For they said, Not during the festival, or there may be a riot among the people. While he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment of nard, and she broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But some were there who said to one another in anger, Why was the ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed good service for me. For you always have the poor with you, and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Truly I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in the remembrance of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray Jesus to them. When they heard it, they were greatly pleased and promised to give him money. So Judas began to look for an opportunity to betray Jesus. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was sacrificed, his disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house. The teacher asks, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparation for us there. So the disciples set out and went to the city, and found everything as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he came with the twelve. And when they had taken their places and were eating, Jesus said, Truthfully I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed, and say to him, one after the other, Surely not I. He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread in the bowl with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written to him, but woo that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not have been born. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I tell you, I will never drink again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom kingdom of God. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters, for it is written. I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. 
but after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though all become deserters, I will not. Jesus said to him, Truly, I tell you, this day, this very night, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said vehemently, Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all of them said the same. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John, and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Peter, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once more he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, and with him there was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I kiss will be the man, arrest him and lead him off under guard. So when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. They then laid hands on him and arrested him. But one of those who stood near drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to them, have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. All of them deserted him and fled. A certain young man was following him, wearing nothing but a linen cloth. They caught hold of him, but he left the linen cloth and ran off naked. They took Jesus to the high priest, and the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes were assembled. Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the guards, warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for a testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none, for many gave false testimony against him, and their testimony did not agree. Some stood up and gave false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another, not made with hands. But even on this point, their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Have you no answer? What is it that they will testify against you? But he was silent and did not answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, Why do we still need witnesses? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? All of them condemned him as deserving death. Some began to spit on him, to blindfold him, and to strike him, saying to him, Prophecy! The guards also took him over 
and beat him. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she stared at him and said, You were also with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. But he denied, saying, I don't know or understand what you were talking about. And he went into the fort court, then the cock crowed. And the servant girl, on seeing him, began again to say the bystanders. This man is one of them. But again, he denied it. Then after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Gal Galilean. But he knew to course, and he swore an oath, I do not know this man who you are talking about. At this moment, the cock crowed for the second time. Then Peter rem remembered that Jesus had said to him, Before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. As soon as, as it was morning, the, chi the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you, king are you the king of Jews? He, he answered him. You say not so. Then the chief priest accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further reply, for the Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival, he used to release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. Then he answered them, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again. Then what do you wish for, for me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Why? What evil has he done? But, the, but they shouted all the more, Crucify him! So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole cohort. And they clothed him in a purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. And they began saluting him, Hail, King of the Jews! They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha! You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, along with the scribes, were also mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now, so that way we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. When it was noon... Darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then some of the bystanders heard it, and they said, Listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to Jesus to drink, saying, Wait, 
Let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way, Jesus breathed his last. He said, truly this man was God's son. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James the younger and of Joses and Salome. These used to follow Jesus and provided for him when he was in Galilee. And there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. When evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate wondered if he were already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he had been dead for some time. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph brought a linen cloth, and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth, and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. Then he rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Jesus saw where the body is laid. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Palm Sunday is a strange mixture of gospel readings and emotions and contrast. Palm Sunday begins with the heights of Jesus's joyful and triumphant entry into Jerusalem. We hear the shouts of Hosanna and the palms are an ancient symbol of victory and triumph. And we will end today's liturgy with a death march, a cry of forsakenness and Jesus's last breath. At the conclusion of today's service this morning, we will bring forth some of the imagery from Monday, Thursday, and you will witness the altar guild stripping the altar before Holy Week, which begins today and our altar will remain bare for the duration of our Holy Week observances. The Palm Sunday liturgy is in fact a mirror. It is holding before us the reality of our life and our world that we know what it is like to live in the tension of victory and defeat, of joy and sorrow, in triumph and in grief, in death and in life. On Palm Sunday, this is the greatest example of our lives and that our lives are not either or, but they are both and. Holy Week is not about choosing between life or death or palm or passion. It's saying that by living this life of faith, you are choosing both life and death, palm and passion. That is the tension of this day. But the challenge our challenge is to remain present in the midst of that tension, to not be spectators, but to be participants, not just this week, but every week, to stand in this tension and know that God is with us. You're invited to stand in the tension this Holy Week. We invite you to join us for the observances of Holy Week that we will share as community in this week ahead. 
And I want you to, as you stand within this tension, to know that to stand firmly, you have to let go of anything that might keep you from fully embracing the events of this week and fully embracing God. And that's what Jesus did. That is the reading we just heard from the Gospel of Mark. Jesus is letting go. Jesus' surrender, Jesus' emptying of himself. And emptying is the way to Jesus and the way of Holy Week. Emptying is our way into God's heart. And as we journey together this blessed Holy Week, we do so in community. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours. Grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, especially during this time of pandemic. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled. On each Sunday during this season of Lent, we fondly remember a few of our beloved parishioners and family members who died this past year. Hi, my name's Jim Robertson, and I'm here to tell you about my dad, Tom Robertson. My dad was born in September of 1926 in Ordway, Colorado, on a farm. It is said that his mom paused long enough from canning peaches to give birth. He grew up on that farm during the depression and dust storms of the 1930s. His high school years were during World War II. He met the Catch Crowley County Lenore Maxson during high school. They were married in July of 1945 and set up housekeeping on the farm. That union would last for 75 years. It would produce six children, 
14 grandchildren and 18 great-grandchildren so far. In the fall of 1954, Dad packed up his family and moved off the farm and to the big city of Denver. He had secured a job working in the power plants for public service where he worked for 32 years and retired as a shift supervisor, keeping the lights and electricity on for all of us. He was a good, respected, dependable man. My relationship with my dad wasn't always all that great. I don't remember spending much one-on-one -on -one time with him growing up. Well, except when I was in trouble. But I do remember that he was at our ball games, our concerts, our school activities. I am grateful that we were able to get a better relationship as I got older. And I am grateful we didn't wait until it was too late to do that. Some of my best memories of my dad was when we would drive to Gunnison for my son's football games at Western State. We would leave early in the morning and get home late at night, which gave us plenty of time to talk and tell stories. I would hear stories of him working in the power plant, stories I had heard thousands of times. But every once in a while, I'd get a new nugget, a new story of him growing up on the farm or maybe an adventure he had with his high school buddies. It was great. In the end, though, it was hard to understand Dad when he tried to talk. He couldn't hear very well. He couldn't taste. He couldn't smell. He couldn't remember very well. He couldn't even remember working at public service. We could talk a little bit about the farm years, and many times when I went to see him, he thought I was his older brother, James, not his son, Jim. The important thing, though, is not so much that they remember who we are, because we remember who they are. My dad passed away this past January, and I remember who he was. He was my dad. I'm Gordy Tucker. I think most of you know me. I am humbled and honored to come before you today and talk a little bit about my sister, Peggy Tucker. Margaret Ann Peggy Tucker was born at Providence Hospital in Seattle, Washington on December 3rd, 1951. She was the second child of six children born to Gordon and Maureen Tucker. I was her elder brother, born 11 months previously on December 20th, 1950. When our birthdays rolled around each year, we joked that we were the same age for 17 days. However, Peggy politely reminded me that I was always older than her, not necessarily wiser, just older. Over the next 10 years, the Tucker family, like all good Catholic families, swelled with four more children. Eileen, born in 1955, Rich in 1956, Mary in 1957, and Teresa in 1960. Peggy's life was tough from the beginning. She was born with cerebral palsy, a condition attributed to an action bordering on medical malpractice. She had difficulty walking and talking, but she was fitted with metal braces in an early age, and every summer she attended speech camps that helped her speak clearly. She grew into what one might call a pretty normal childhood, although she always fussed about people looking at her strangely and worse yet, pityingly. She attended an elementary school for the devel developmentally disabled and then St. Matthew's Catholic grade school in Seattle. And then she enrolled at Holy Angels, an all girls high school in the Ballard area of Seattle. She graduated in 1969. Following high school, Peggy continued to live at home, but she worked for several companies and she even had a boyfriend. She eventually went on to earn an associate's degree from North Seattle Community College. But Peggy's pot body betrayed her once again. At age 20, she was diagnosed with type one diabetes. She needed to take daily shots of insulin and carefully watch her diet. As a result, a normal life for Peggy was now only a broken dream and she was forever dependent on her parents. Nevertheless, Peggy had a comfortable life 
with several good friends, an indomitable spirit, and she loved animals. Her dogs, Sophie Tucker, get it, Misty, and others were her beloved companions. When our, Peggy, when our parents and Peggy moved north from Seattle to Camino Island, Peggy thrived, taking classes in therapeutic horsemanship and winning awards for her writing. Nevertheless, Peggy's medical issues slowly but gradually worsened, and it became more and more difficult for her to engage in external activities. She became adept at the typewriter and then the computer, and she used those instruments to write poignant poetry. Her mind was sharp, whip smart, said a former schoolmate of hers, but her body increasingly said no. Our father died in 2004 and Peggy continued to live with our mother on Camino Island. Eventually, however, the upkeep of their large home became too much for mom and Peggy and I and my siblings moved them to an adult family home in Shoreline, north of Seattle. They lived there for a couple of years and the care was good, but we eventually had to move Peggy to an assisted living facility in South Seattle. Our mother pa peacefully passed away at the family home, the assisted family home, in 2019. Peggy celebrated her 69th birthday on December 3rd, 2020, but soon thereafter contracted COVID-19, from which she died on December 18th, 2020. Our sister Mary wrote the following in Peggy's obituary. Peggy had a fearless spirit, and all she ever wanted to be was to be like everybody else. She wanted people to know that she was capable. She wanted to matter in this world. Peggy spoke to the, mat, the, the dream of mattering in her poem titled, Answering a Challenge. Let me read it to you. Searching for a pillar of strength. I gamble at many games. Winnings are few and far between. Callous people call me names. My gait is scissor-like and my speech a monotone. Thus I am rendered unintelligent. Criticism of me always seems full-blown. Ignorance forms savage minds. I realize this way of thinking. I need to locate hidden talents, talents to keep, to keep self-esteem from shrinking. The answer to my troubles has always sat in front of me. People now marvel at my creativity. What a friend my typewriter proves to be. From a poetic kaleidoscope, poems by Peggy. Peggy had a tough life, but she's now with other family members who have passed on. And I know she's running on that heavenly beach. Requiescat got in pace, Peg. I love you. Let us pray. Loving God, we pray to you for Peggy and for all those whom we love but see no longer. Grant them eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. May her soul and the souls of all the departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We offer our prayers of thanksgiving for those celebrating birthdays and anniversaries this week. One birthday omitted last week, David Richards, March the 7th. Tom Pullen, celebrating 95 years, March 24th. Previous anniversary, Oyuna and Bill Padfield, March 18th. Birthdays this week, Clark Halston, March 29th. Gary Peters, April 1st. Francis White, April 2nd. Rob Ayers, April 2nd. And Tanner McDonald, April the 3rd.
Let us pray. O oh God, our times are in your hands. Look with favor, we pray, on your servants as they begin another year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace. Send your blessings upon them, that their homes may be a haven of peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. The glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. By the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for joining us for worship on this Palm Sunday. As we conclude today's liturgy during our postlude, our altar guild will strip the altar. The altar will lay bare for the remainder of this week of Holy Week. The altar will then be adorned again as we prepare for Easter services. You're invited to remain online after today's service for our final installment of our Lenten Bible study, the Book of Job. We hope that you join us in this sacred week of Holy Week. May Jesus Christ, the Savior and Redeemer of this world, bless you and keep you. May the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, heal and restore you. May the Lord God order all your days and deeds in peace. And the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.